for 12 years. This will be our 12th year. And it's moved from Kutztown to Bowers and to Hamburg. Um, and I think it's just become, and maybe from the start has been a celebration of life. So it is a life choices fundraiser, but also just a gathering of people who value life for a really fun day. For me, the 5K is a way for our community to gather around, to celebrate life's choices, to celebrate the work we do, and to share the support they have for meaningful life in our community. Before it, you get all hyped up, you know, like it's the hype of the, the run. I like the friendly competition that's, that's there. I like to compete a little more. My favorite part has to be the kids doing the chick chase because they have so much energy and enthusiasm and they're excited whether they come in first or last and really like the kids are a good symbol of the work we do. Like we love seeing these kids grow and develop and be the person God meant them to be. Also, it's a lot of fun to come to the 5K. It's kind of like a fun celebration. People come and then they stay, you know, even an hour after the event is over. We have kind of a festival feel. So there's a lot of things for families and even for adults who are young at heart. We have bouncy houses and animal balloons. We have Chick-fil-A sandwiches. Everyone loves Chick-fil-A. And we have prizes and awards that we give. So if you come to the 5K, you are showing your support for all the work we do. And having that big group together in our community, marching together, walking together, really shows people from the outside that this is something our whole community can stand behind. And that a lot of people actually support the efforts we do. Look, Natalie. Thank you for running. Thank you for helping us out during our time of need. That's why we run. Yep. Good morning, everybody. Good to see you all. Good morning to people joining us on the internet. Glad you're joining us for worship today. Very good. Eric, are you going to run in that 5K? Nope. No. <laughs> oh, that negates that announcement. Oh, somebody's got to run. Tina, you'll run, right? You're not running either. Oh, my goodness. My family went running yesterday in Concha Hocken, and they invited me. No, no, no. But you all can run. You can run. You can run. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll run for this. Well, thank you for coming. We're glad you're here. Let me open with prayer. Lord, we thank you for this day. Thank you for your love. Thank you for the ability to run, the legs to run, uh, the pleasure that we can get from exercise and the beauty of the world. Somebody at the first service was saying how beautiful it was. The sun was coming out streaming in the same gla stained glass windows. Thank you for the beauty that you surround us with. And we ask your blessing in this time of worship. In your name we pray. Amen. So good morning again and welcome to Zion's Church. We invite you to stand and greet one another. Cause I know you make a way And I don't always understand And I don't always get to see But I will believe it I will believe it You make mountains move You make giants fall You hear songs of praise Praise and walls, and I will speak to my fear. 
Are you past the point of weary? Is your burden weighing heavy? Is it all too much to carry? Let me tell you about my Jesus. Do you feel that empty feeling? Cause shame's done all its stealing. And you're desperate for some healing. Let me tell you about my Jesus. He makes a way.
maybe hitting us right between the eyes, allow us to open our hearts, to not push back too hard, but to know that it may have been intended just for us. So Lord, we thank you, we love you, and we are so pleased to be here today, to be in your house, to hear your message. We ask all of this in your name. Everyone, a couple of announcements. Uh, Bricktastic Bash is uh, the Sunday after Easter, and it's for f uh, preschool through fifth grade and their families, and they're going to build Lego blocks and have a meal and all that kind of stuff. So it's going to be great. Spread the word and encourage others to come. This week, the Journey Cafe is closed. Uh, Dan is on vacation, so we're going to cancel all the activities at the Journey this week. So people get a break. And uh, we had a, a death last week of a woman named Betty Atkinson, so we extend our sympathies to her family. And uh, just want to pray this morning as we open. Lord, we thank you for the chance to be here, and we pray your blessing on everybody that's here uh, in person, remotely. And we, we ask that you would comfort Betty's family and her loss and uh, just encourage them. And we pray for... Uh, people that had a rough week. I know people had a rough, I know some people that had a rough week. Pray that you'd be with them and give them strength and encouragement and direction in their life and just minister to them by the power of your Holy Spirit. And we pray now that as we gather to hear your word from your word that you would just speak into our hearts and lives, Lord, by the power of your Holy Spirit. In your name we pray, amen. So I want to begin with a video clip, and this video is uh, that of a uh, father who's trying to win the favor of his child, and uh, he's just trying to win her over. Here's this video clip. There's a good father, right? Did what he took, whatever it took to, to win the heart of the, his little girl, little daughter. I'll come back to him in a bit. Uh, but before I get to that, I want to play poker. Anybody here ever play poker? Nobody wants to admit they play poker. Yeah, poker. I, I play poker right even never for money. Uh, two reasons. I just pe see people damaged by uh, gambling. I just don't have anything to do with that. But also because... I'm not going to spend any money in a silly game like that. That's ridiculous. But I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play a game here. I'm going to play a game of poker here. And in this game, well, the chips. I have three chips. Three chips. One is uh, a white one. That's a one. And then the red is a five. And the blue is a ten. So can you imagine playing poker for money? Okay, if this is a penny and this is a nickel and that's a dime, maybe that's not bad. But if this is, if this is a dollar and this is five dollars and this is ten dollars, 
Yeah, I know what it adds up to be. Thank you. Like $16, are you kidding me? 16 chicken dollars for one half. Yo, put in, I'll bid 16. What, are you nuts? Like, holy crow, this makes me want to go to the bathroom. But I'm not, I'm not doing this at a one, a five, and a 10. I'm gonna call this a 10 and a 50 and a 100. Anybody in? No, no, I'm gonna make it better than that. Some little kid put their hand up. Your grandparents are yanking your hand down. No way. No way. But let's say, this is not a 10. This is a 100. This is a 500. And this is a 1,000. Anybody in? Like, I am losing my mind. I'm losing my mind. Like, I, there's, no, there's no chance. Put a gun to my head. I'm not playing this game. Holy crow, this is terrible. This is a terrible idea. But anyway, I got... I got those, and now I know there's different things, you can play different types of poker and there's different phases of poker, but we're down to the last bit, okay? We're down to the last bit of this particular hand, and I'm sitting with a full house, eight high, all right? Full house, eight high, there's nothing wild, okay? And I got three other people playing at the table with me, and I've gotta make a bid, and, and the stakes are, 100, 500, and 1,000, how much do you think I should bid? You, look, look, here's what I would bid. Zero! I'll take my chips and go home. There's no way I'm playing. But no, I got to play. So what am I going to bid on this hand? Yeah, your 1,000. Yeah, I'll bid your 1,000. That's fine. I'll build your 1,000. Your 1,000. Well, before we find out how that unfolds, and now I'm going to put two stories in the shelf. I'm going to put the story of the... Father with the mustache, we're we'll gonna put him over here, and then I'm gonna put the, the poker game over here, and now I'll tell you a story about Jesus, okay? Can we talk, talk about Jesus here? So here's the story. It involves a guy that could be playing in this game, okay? He has the kind of capital he could play in the game without batting an eye. He's rich. And he comes to Jesus, now you know the story. He comes to Jesus, he comes to Jesus with a question. He says, Jesus, what do I have to do to inherit eternal life? What, what, what do I have to do? What do I have to do to get in? And, and he's got his checkbook open, okay? What do I have to do? What, the, what are the hoops? What do I have to do to, to get into heaven? And Jesus says, you know what? You've got to be good. In a sense, that's what he said. Listen, he said, if you want to receive eternal life, keep the commandments. He le the rich man, he leans forward a little bit. He says, oh, okay, which, which, which commandments? And so Jesus starts re uh, you know, reciting them. He says, you must not murder. You, you must not commit adultery. You must not steal. You must not testify falsely. You should lie. You must honor your father and mother. And you need to love your neighbor as you love yourself. That's what you have to do. And he's like, the rich man, he's like, well, let's see. Don't kill. I've never killed anybody. I've never killed anybody. Don't commit adultery. He's a young guy, so he's not been married very long, but he's never committed adultery yet, and he has no intent, truly, no intention of committing adultery. You can't see that happening in his life. So I've not killed anybody. I've not, not committed adultery. What's the next one? You must not steal. This guy's a rich guy. Sometimes we put rich guys in a, uh, in a box and we say, rich guys, all the rich guys are corrupt. You could say that, like he ripped people. No, I have never, he says, ripped anybody off. I played it above board. So he's not, never stolen anything, never took any advantage. You, may not, you must not testify falsely. You must not lie. Now, he says, I've never lied. Me neither, except for yesterday. My 95-year-old uh, aunt had her birthday party. And that's when you lie, right? That's, that's when you lose her. Like, you lie and say, no, I don't know anything. There's no party, you know, like that kind of thing. You know, it's really probably a bad idea to have a surprise birthday for party for a 95-year-old person. You know what I mean? Like, that's just not smart thinking. But we'll just let that slide. You know, except for the surprise birthday parties, I lie, I, I lie about those, but other than that, I'm good for that too, he says. You know, I've not lied. 
Uh, honor your father and mother. I'm, I'm good with that. Love my parents. I inherited some of the money from them. You know, I'm good with them. And love your neighbors yourself. I'm generous. So, so here's the deal. He says, you must not murder. You must not commit adultery. You must not steal. You must not lie. You must, not, you must honor your parents. And you must love your neighbors. You love yourself. And the guy says, check, 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 check. I've done it. I'm good. I'm golden. Anything else? And Jesus says, yeah, 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 yeah. Here's one more thing. Sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor and you'll have, tr- you'll have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. Guy hears that. Drops his jaw, drops his head, and he walks away. And the disciples were blown away. They were blown away. Scripture says... The disciples were astounded. And they said to Jesus, then who in the world can be saved? Here's why they're so perplexed. They're thinking, this guy is rich. I know, we think some people are rich. No, people, here's the mind inside the disciples' head. Here's here's the way they thought. If you're rich, that must mean that you've been blessed by God. Rich people were blessed by God. They're rich because God blessed them. So this guy is blessed by God. He's rich. And he's good. He's rich and he's good. And he can't make it. That's how the disciples are seeing this. It's like he's rich and he's good. And he hasn't made it like, where's room for us here? Like if this rich good guy doesn't make it, Where are we going to stand with Jesus? Like he's rich and he's good. Jesus goes on. He says this. Jesus said to his disciples, I tell you the truth. It's very hard for a rich guy, rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. I say it again. It's easier for a camel to get through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Now, don't get distracted by the eye of the needle comment. That's, you know, if you don't know this, the, the, the fence structure that they had, there's some fencing system and then they have this post, I suppose, and that's called the needle, and there's an opening, the the eye of the needle, and there's an opening there, and some very agile, and I've seen them already, agile camels squeeze through the fence every now and then, you know, it's just like, anybody ever see a cow out that got through a fence around here, right, no farmer wants her cows to get out, but every now they do, like we, one time we had a cow walk through our backyard. We used to have eight, uh, nine blueberry bushes and the cow walked through our backyard and destroyed one. We only have eight, you know, the, the cows get out. So do camels. Every now and then, camels can get through the eye of the needle. If they're small or they're agile, they get through the eye of the needle every now and then. And so Jesus was not saying, no rich guy is ever going to make it. He's saying, it's tough. It's just remote because of how they live their life and how they have, what, what values they have in their lives. He says it's, it's just not something that often happens. So the disciples are hearing all this. See, we often, I've often thought, oh, this is a story about the rich young ruler. It's actually a story about the rich young ruler, but it's also a story about the disciples and how they're processing things and how they gain salvation. So the disciples are hearing this and thinking, this rich guy that's blessed by God and this good guy is not going to make it. What chance do we have? Like he's rich and he's good, and they're, they're, really, they're really troubled about that because they always thought that we're, this rich good guy, he, he surely can make it, but, but they're not. Question. They're comparing themselves to the rich good guy. Have you ever compared yourself to anybody? Anybody here ever make a comparison, right? We've all made comparisons, right? Like in school, these, these people are smarter than I am. I'm not as smart as other people, right? You might make that comparison. You might make a comparison where the, the, this girl in the class, she's the prettiest and I'm not. Or uh, he's the most or she's the most athletic or uh, he or she is the most, uh, has the most musical talent or he or she is best with her hands. Or he, and we make these comparisons and sometimes we're, we're better in those comparisons, and sometimes we're not as good, but we, we all make comparisons. That's what's going on here in the story. The disciples are looking at the rich, that is blessed, good guy, making a comparison and saying, how do we measure up? If this rich, good guy is not going to make it, how are we going to make it? Have you ever looked at somebody else 
Not just, hey, they're more an athlete than I am, but they're much, 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 much further along spiritually. And how do I stack up? Sometimes with money, if we get in trouble financially, and we have bill collectors calling us, and we have the, the, the landlord pressing us for the rent, and that kind of thing, we get in such deep trouble financially that we, we're in this hole. We don't know how to dig ourselves out, right? You, you, either you've had that experience, you know people like that. Like, how do we get out of this financial abyss that we're in? And, and we can't catch up. And when you really, really can't catch up at all, finally you end up deciding we better, the only option for us is to file for bankruptcy. You know, sometimes it's possible for us to look at someone else not really having a full understanding of what salvation is. And look at them and how good they are and look at us and what, what's true of our life and decide to file for spiritual bankruptcy. What's the point of even trying anymore? Have you ever felt that way? Do you know anyone that's ever felt that way? Like this, that's where we sometimes can be. Now let me get back to the poker game, okay? Let me get back to the poker game. So I'm playing poker, and I want, I want to talk about the poker game, and I want to relate it to the guy that's, that's coming, that's rich. What does Jesus really want me to do in this poker game? If I can connect the two stories, what does he really want? Let me read, let me read a little more from the story. He says this. Listen, listen. He says... Here's all the things you should do. Done, done that, done that, done that. I'm good to go. And then anything else. And then Jesus says, sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. Now, when you read that, what do you think? Oh, Jesus expects us to give all of our money away. And maybe he does. I don't think that's the primary thrust of it. He's not merely saying that we have to give our money away. He's saying something else. Did you hear what he said? He said... Sell all your possessions, give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. I don't think he's merely talking about money. I think he's talking about the totality of your life. He wants all of you. I think he is okay with us keeping things for ourselves, having something to wear and that kind of thing. I think he's okay with that. But what he's saying in this mess, in this scripture is, in this event, is you got to, you go, you got to go all in. You gotta follow me. You gotta absolutely, totally follow me. So if I relate to this, this, this game, I, I've, I've got what do I have here. I have a full house with what's high? Oh, you're paying attention. I just want to see. Sometimes when you can't answer the simple questions, I, I get discouraged. I think, oh, they're not paying attention. So I've got a full house, eight's high. Somebody came out of church and said, You do know a straight flush would beat that. Yes, I know that. Gee, four of a kind would beat it too, I said to the person. But I've got, but that's a pretty good hand here, right? What did Jesus want me to bid on this hand? Glenn, he was going big. He, because it's my money he's given away. No problem here for Glenn. He's a big gambler when it's. But Jesus goes, Jesus goes further than Glenn. What does Jesus want me to do? Everything. Right? That's what he's talking about. He wants us to go all in with everything we have, totally all in. That's that's what he's calling for us to do, all in. Let's go back to the story with the father with the mustache. How long do you have that mustache? You know when when he started his mustache? When he had peach fuzz right here. That's when he started. He was 14 years old, said, how do you like my mustache? Uh, what mustache? <laughs> and then, uh, what mustache? But eventually it starts taking shape, right? It starts taking shape. And he's had it, and he's not, what, I don't know what age he is now. Did you see him looking at that picture? Who's that picture of? His father. Or maybe it's even his grandfather. See, we, all of us from this clan, we all, we all, we all have our mustaches, right? And so now he's holding this baby, this daughter of his, and he's looking at her, and, one, and she's like, ah! And he has a scary mask on his face, right? Did you see that scary mask? And he pulls up, she's more scared by his mug than that mask. And, ah! and he has a decision to make. 
Because he's, he's had this mustache his entire life. It's not a big deal maybe to us, but it's a big deal to him. And what does he say? You know what? I'm all in as a father. Right? And we look at that and we say, there's a father. He's all in as a father. What does Jesus want? He wants us to go all in with God. All in. Every chip. He wants us all, he wants us to be in in the totality of our life. Everything. Total commitment to God. But the disciples, the disciples are unnerved. As they're looking at Looking at what Jesus said to the rich man and thinking, man, this guy is rich, therefore blessed, and good. What chance is there for us? And they're not getting it. They're not fully getting it. All they see is the rich guy walking away and they're thinking, making a comparison. We're never going to make it. That's what they're thinking. And so right after this, as soon as this thing is over, Jesus tells a story. I don't know if you ever noticed it before, but there's a story. I, I was just quoting the story from Matthew. Right after that, very next thing, Jesus says, okay, guys, take a chill pill. Let me tell you a little story. And so he tells them a story. Here's the story. He says, and you'll recognize it. He says, once upon a time, there was a guy that owned a vineyard. Now, let me just tell you something about the Bible. Every guy owns a vineyard, okay? But this guy owns a vineyard, and it's a great picking time. And I'm sure that all of you are good vineyard owners. You know that when the grapes are ripe, you got to pick them. So he, he goes on Indeed.com to get some grape pickers. Actually, he doesn't. They don't have Indeed.com. They have something else. They have a marketplace. As he goes early in the morning... See if anybody wants a job. Because everybody lives hand to mouth. Everybody goes, I don't know what I'm doing tomorrow. I, I know what I'm doing today. I'm just happy about today. So he goes down to the marketplace and all, all these people are hanging around. This is how they work in this culture. And, and he looks around and says, hey, great picking time. Anybody want a job? I'm hiring people. Silver coins in it for you. 10, 15 guys. Works for me. That's good. That's fair wage. I'll come. So they... They leave the marketplace six in the morning and they start working. And they're working, working. He goes back because he can use as many people as he can get. And some people, they've already completed a, a short term job and they're back for more. Or maybe they had something happen in their family, couldn't get to the marketplace. It's now nine o'clock. He comes, hey, you guys want a job? Yeah, I'll take a job. And he, he hires them. And he still can use more. He can use everybody he can get. He comes back, back at 12 noon, says, hey, hey, you want a job? Yeah, some more people say, yeah, we'll work. And they go down to the field and they're working. And then at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, he picks more people up. He says, hey, you want a job? Yeah, we want a job. At 5 o'clock in the afternoon, yeah, we want a job. And now it's pudding time at 6 o'clock. And he calls them all together. See, they, they don't pay every other week. They don't, it's not automatic deposit in your bank account. They don't have bank accounts. They need the money today, even if they did. They need it now. It's hand them out. They get paid every day. So he says every day, okay, pay time. And he calls the people over that were hired at, at, at 5 o'clock in the afternoon. Worked one stinking hour. Come on over here. Here you go. And he hands them, each of those guys that were hired at 5 o'clock, he hands them a silver coin. Meanwhile, the guys that were hired at 6 o'clock are watching this and thinking, sweet. Right? Are you reading their minds? Sweet. They're getting one silver coin. What am I getting? I don't know, but it's greater than one silver coin. It's something more. I, this is nice. Bonus time here. This is great. I'm really glad I came to work here. And they're like, they're, th they're feeling pretty good. Then he pays the people who are hired at 3 o'clock. One silver coin. Then he hire, they, uh, pays the people who are hired at 12 noon. They work six hours, and he pays them one silver coin. Then he comes to the people who were hired at 9 o'clock. They work nine hours, and he pays them one silver coin. Then he comes over to the people that were hired at 6 in the morning, and he gives them one silver coin, and they say, what's up? See, what they don't understand is that God can do what he wishes. And, and here's the problem with this story. Every time you've heard this story, typically people react negatively to it. And none of us like this story. This is one of the stories where you say, well, I'm going to have to ask God about that one when I get to heaven. I just don't get it. Mm -mm. Yeah, you, you don't get it. You, you don't get it. You're right. 
Because here's, here's the point of the story. What does, what does the vineyard owner expect of those who work for him? What does he expect? When you're hired at 6 in the morning, what does he expect? He expects you to... What does he expect? He expects you to... And then when you come at 9 o'clock and he wants you to bring your work attitude to the table and work for me at 9 o'clock, what does he expect? And then at 12 noon, all in. And then at 3 o'clock, all in. And 5 o'clock... See, what God expects of us at some point in our lives, what he expected of the rich man that came to Jesus, what he expects of us is for us to be all in. Here's, here's the problem. I became a Christian when I was five years old. Five years old. I followed Jesus when I was five. And I never really walked away from Jesus. And I'm, you know, many year, a couple years older than that now. And I never walked away from him. And you know what? In the teenage years, I didn't do a lot of stuff that teenagers sometimes do. I'm not bragging. I'm just saying this is just the way it is. It's just my reality. I, I didn't do drugs and alcohol and all that stuff. I didn't mess around. And, and I, I'd never gotten divorced. Well, maybe once, but she doesn't know it yet, and she's here. No, I've never gotten divorced. Zip, zip, mom's a word. No, I've never, I've never done all these different things. You know what I mean? I've never done all these things. And so a person can look at me. See, I was hired by God at 6 in the morning. Do you understand that? I was hired by God at 6 in the morning. And other people, maybe somebody here in this room could look at me that way, or maybe somebody listening at the other service, could look, or maybe somebody down at the Journey Cafe is going to hear this, maybe they're listening, or maybe somebody on the internet is hearing me, and they're comparing themselves to me and saying, this guy was hired at six in the morning, and Randy has never done all of this stuff that I've done. And then they make a comparison, see, we make comparisons, and they compare themselves to me and say, I've done this, and I've done that, and I've done this, and I've done that, and I've had a, a dysfunctional family, and I have, I've created a dysfunctional family, and I didn't have any of that. I didn't have a dysfunctional family. My parents loved each other. We don't, the only fight I ever saw my parents have was when we were traveling in Fort Lauderdale, Florida on a vacation trip, and my mother wanted to stop in and see James Kennedy's church, and my father didn't want to, and they were silent for the next 10 miles, and I thought, whoa, a fight. Knock down, drag out, in the Bond household. De details at 11. It was like, that's the only fight I ever saw. How many of you can say that? The only fight you ever saw was your mother not talking to your father for 10 miles? That's the only thing you got? No. A lot of us have had, that's my life. It's just my life. I'm not bragging. I'm not saying, I'm just descriptive. So you look at me, and you've got all this colored past. And you say, how can I ever catch up? How can, how can I ever make it? Like, he was hired at 6 in the morning. I've not been hired. I'm not even contemplating being hired until 5 o'clock. And guess what's happened? Like, at 9 o'clock, people that are hired. I was hired at 6 o'clock in the morning. Anybody here hired at, at, at 9 o'clock? Yeah, actually, somebody here came to Christ at the age of 17. You were hired at, you were hired at 9 o'clock. And you made some bad teenage choices, but you were hired at 9 o'clock. And you've been walking with Jesus since 9 o'clock. And some others here, they, they, you, were, you were hired at 12 noon. That's when, at the age of 42, your marriage went belly up, and you were at a point of great desperation. You called out to Jesus, and that's when you were hired by Jesus. And, and, and some other people here are or, or listening to me on the Internet or down to the cafe or wherever. Some of you maybe were hired at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And you have a colorful past. And there's some people, there's somebody I'm talking to today, it's hired at 5 o'clock. Somebody hired at 5 o'clock might be in prison, on death row, having you know, the rich guy that was good, who never committed adultery, never killed, never stealed, never honored his parents and all those things. This guy did all of that. His death row, three weeks to live. How does God judge him compared to me? Seriously. The guy in death row, state prison, Camp Hill, he's going to be killed. How does God compare him to me? Here's how God compares him to me. Here's the question God asks. Are you all in? Doesn't matter when you get all in. It matters that you are all in. Here's another story Jesus tells, not in sequence, but he's, he's driving home the point to the guys, to the disciples. What does it mean?
to be saved. And what he's saying is you need to be a follower of mine. You need to be all in. That's what Jesus is saying to them, and he's saying to us. Here's another story. Illustrates the same point. This woman was in the temple. And, and the guys were sitting on the back pew back there. And, and the disciples, Jesus and the disciples, they're just sitting there. You remember the plastic offering box thing there? And they're watching what people... Now, that's rude. You shouldn't be sitting back there watching what people are dropping. But they were. Jesus and the disciples, they were... They were watching what people were dropping. And see, they didn't have offering envelopes. They didn't give, use checks. They had money. And it's like, the guys are like, whoa, whoa, that's a lot of money. Jesus sat down near the collection box in the temple and watched as the crowds dropped in their money. Many rich people put in large amounts. And then a poor widow came along. And she dropped in two small coins. Jesus called his disciples to him, hey, guys, 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 I tell you the truth. This poor widow has given more than all the others who are making contributions. For they gave a tiny part of their surplus, but she, poor she is, has given everything she has to live in. What impressed Jesus about the woman? She was what? She was all in. She was all in. And here's the thing. We don't know about the woman, but the woman was poor. She was a widow. You could say, oh, man, uh, God hasn't blessed her. Her husband died, doesn't have much money, maybe. And you know what? We don't know it. We just think she's a wonderful person, but maybe she wasn't. Maybe she, was a, maybe she was a prostitute at some point. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what she did. What matters is Jesus sees her dropping two coins, and he says, now there's a woman that's all in. What does Jesus want? He wants us to be all in. That's what he wants more than anything else. He wants us to be all in. Now, let me, uh, let me talk to you. Some of you were hired by Jesus at 6 in the morning. Okay? You following me? Some of you were hired at 9, some of you 12. But here's what, let's just run with the person hired at 6 in the morning. A person like me. I've been faithful to Jesus my whole life, and now it's 3 in the afternoon. What happens if I'm working in the vineyard at 3 o'clock in the afternoon? What's happening? Man, it's stinking hot out here. Man, it's stinking hot. And I pick up another basket. Ah! And now i got three more hours, three more hours of life yet to go. In stinking hot conditions, ah, and a nagging, aching back. Do people who have... Walk with Jesus in 6 o'clock in the morning, ever have problems in their life where things go belly up and they get mad at God? Anybody? Does that ever happen? Where I've been walking with Jesus since 6 o'clock this morning, and now it's 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and, and things happen, ah, and I'm, yeah. Some of you may have walked with Jesus for a, a good long time. I don't know when. How long? But something's happened. Let's... Let's be honest here, inside your head, inside your head, no calling out, inside your head. Right now, you were all in at one point, but right now, in your life, right now, pay attention to me, right now, because of stuff, truthfully inside your head, you're not all in. Nobody else knows it. You're sitting here right now, or you're listening at home on the internet, or sitting down at the cafe, everybody thinks you're all in. Not all in. You're not all in. And there's only one person that knows you're not all in. That's you. What does Jesus want? He wants us to be all in. I'm calling you out. If you're not all in today, whoever you are, I'm calling you out. It's time to get all in again. Make a decision today to get all in with God. Right now, today. All in. The totality of your life. The scripture says, Jesus, the guy said to Jesus, hey, what do I have to do? S give everything away and, and, and follow me. That's what it means to be all in. Follow me. Follow me. Whatever he wants you to do. Right now, somebody listening to me, either in this service or one of the other services or at the cafe or on the internet, somebody is, 
used to walk with Jesus and you still look like you're walking with Jesus and you're kind of walking with Jesus, but you're not all in on calling you out today, or rather God is, today's a day to recommit. Admit it in your head, don't lie to yourself. I'm not all in right now. It's the truth. I used to be, I would like to be, I'm not in. Admit it, confess it, today's a day to get all in. And there's also somebody listening to me in this service, or one of the others, or on the internet, or down at the Journey Cafe. Somebody's listening to me right now, and you've never been all in. And you're still fixated, or you're still stuck back in that place. We're making comparisons to people like me. And you're saying, whoa, this person is so high in the scale, I'll never measure up. I am spiritually bankrupt. God, guess what? God is a solution for your spiritual bankrupt condition. You are spiritually bankrupt, but he is a solution for that. Know what it is? It's Jesus. You've never opened your life to Jesus. Somebody here listening to me, somebody on the internet listening to me right now, never opened your heart to Jesus. Today's your day. You know the truth in your head. Today's the day. Today. Come on. Today's the day. Today's the day you say, I don't know why, but I believe you love me, God. Today's a day where you say to God, man, I've done plenty of wrong things. That good guy, that good rich guy in the Bible, man, he didn't steal and I've stolen. And I, you, or, or maybe not as big a deal, but I've done wrong things. I've messed up royally. I believe you love me. I know I've messed up. And I believe Jesus died on the cross to wash away my sin. Today, I open my life to you. Jesus, today, I want to go all in, all in. Two groups of people I'm talking to today, and I'm going to close in prayer, and I'm inviting you to join me in prayer. You know that you were hired by God when you, it was 6 o'clock in the morning, and you were all in, but now it's 12 noon or 3 o'clock, and mm -mm, not right now. Today's a day to recommit. Commit to being all in with Jesus. And if you've never invited Christ into your life, if you've never invited Christ into your life, today's the day to do it. Today's the day to ask Jesus in your life, go all in. Let's pray. Pray, pray and commit yourself to Jesus in whatever ways are appropriate. Lord God, thank you for loving me. Thank you for dying on the cross for me, for the forgiveness of my sins. Today, I open my heart to you. I invite you to come into my life, but I want to do more than that. I want to be all in. All in. I want to, I want to go where you want me to go and follow you wherever you want me to follow you. I want to live my life as you want me to live it, no matter what the price is. I will follow you. Or, God, I thank you for the life I've had with you. It's been good. But between you and me, Lord, you know the truth of my heart. I'm ashamed to admit it. Other people around me don't see through me and see who I really am on the inside. But Lord... Right now, truthfully, I'm not all in. Not all in. Please forgive me. And help me by the power of your Holy Spirit change my heart, change my life, and without any reservation at all, fully follow you wherever you lead. Part three to this prayer, Lord, Anybody that made a commitment today, anybody that made a commitment of any sort today, strengthen their resolve. Let this be a line in the sand day for them where this is a day. They pushed all the chips of their life in and they run with that the rest of their life. Give them the power and bless them to follow through always. In your name we pray, amen.
God, we just give you thanks for, for the message today. Lord, I just ask that you would help us to realize that it's not a gamble to form a relationship with you. There's no gamble involved. Your arms are wide open. You know, you know all, the, all of our past. It doesn't matter to you. Lord God, I just thank you for for your unconditional love and for the blessings, for the blessings that you shower into our lives, those things that, that let us know you're there. And Lord God, I thank you for the struggles because through those struggles, it strengthens our faith. It makes us, it makes us rely on you more. You know, a lot of times we think we can do this on our own and we get ourselves in a bad situation. God, I just thank you for, for the hand up. Every time we stumble and we fall, you're right there. You will not leave us nor forsake us. I just thank you for, for your mercy and for your grace. And, and I pray now that as we leave this beautiful house of yours, that we can just shine a bright light into this world. And may we gather back here safely to share in the joys and the burdens of this next week. And may we just always find ways to bring you honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a great week.